call to order our regular session of the Surt City Council of October 22nd, 2019. First item of business we have this evening is the opening prayer and the pledges of allegiance to the flags of the United States and the state of Texas, which will be led by Councilmember Larson. If you all join me in standing, please. Dear Heavenly Father, we pray and thank you for your many blessings and the wonderful weather that we're enjoying. And uh, Lord, I want to pray for the artists that we have in our presence tonight, um, that they never stop creating, uh, that they never lose faith in their ability to create, and that they continuously exercise uh, the muscle of art and beauty in their lives. And we pray for uh, wisdom and guidance in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Pledge allegiance. All right, we have several presentations this evening um, and a couple of proclamations. So we're going to begin, however, first with the introduction of the student mayors and student council members for the day, a program that's been going on now for a, a number of years and has been quite successful. Uh, and Ms. Brenda, I'll turn it over to you if you'll lead us through this part of the agenda. Yes, my name is Brenda Dennis. I'm the city secretary. Again, we had today our student mayor and student council for the day program. What this is, is the um, students from the seventh and eighth graders from our junior high schools that are chosen to come and participate and learn a little bit about municipal government, but also learn a little bit about um, the decisions that the council has to make. Uh, we posed a question to them, and I want to thank Melissa uh, Yulhorn, because she really had them thinking and asking some good questions today. Uh, I want to thank the council members that came, Dr. Brown, uh, uh, Assistant City Manager Charles Kelm. Uh, we couldn't have done this without their participation. Uh, the kids, uh, I've asked them to kind of put together something that they learned today, introduce themselves, tell them who they are, what school they're from, and kind of introduce. And then after that, if I could have yourself, Mayor, and, and the City Manager come down, we'll present them with a certificate. Great. Well, then what I'd like to do is ask that we, we start from the outside of that desk over there and move from left to right and just come down. Introduce yourself. What school do you go to? You're serving as a student council member or, or student mayor today and whatever comments you have about what you learned today. So please and grab the microphone, turn it to you and hit that button so it's green. Okay, so my name is Rita Estes. I'm a seventh grader at Dobie Junior High. Today I learned about what it's like to be on the council. They have to make decisions that coincide on what's best for the people and what's for best for the city. I also learned how our EMTs, firefighters, and policemen work hand in hand. We owe a lot to our emergency services and I thank them very sincerely. Excellent, thank you for joining us today. Please. My name is Owen Moore, and today I came from Dobie Junior High, and today I learned how all of the three districts, the PD, the EMS, and the fire station, all work together to be like three pieces in a puzzle. And I also learned that being in the city council isn't as easy as it seems, but it's still pretty fun. Here, here. Please. So my name is Paul Mankey from the eighth grade uh, at Corbett Junior High. Sorry for the hair, football. Uh, what I learned today is that the budget is incorporated to almost everything that we do at City Council and for uh, firefighters and police and EMS. And the experiences and how, how things work around the council, like how everything's voted into this for the people, for the city. Thank you. Very good. Um, Please. My name is Tiffany Livingston. I go to Corbett Junior High. And today I learned about how the EMS, the police department, and the fire department work together to protect the city of Shirts. Wonderful. Thank you for joining us. 
Before Mr. Um, sorry, before Dr. Brown and I come down, I, I, we've been doing this now, Ms. Brenda, for what? Twice a year for four years? So every quarter. So four times a year then. Uh, and, and we've had a lot of our students who have come through. And, and what we do, what they're talking about, is we, we provide to the students an item that has come before council in the past or that will be coming before council in the future and give them a real life situation to consider, inclusive of information that comes from staff and from various departments and indeed some of the people that join us, some of the council members will come up and will speak as residents as we have hearing of residents this evening and we ask them to consider everything that they've heard and ultimately render a decision. Uh, so when they say that it's, they learned a lot and they see things a little differently, they, they sat up here in these chairs and did this job. So uh, for that, again, congratulations to all four of you and we'll meet you down here in just a moment. So good stuff. So before we uh, move on to the next item, I would like not only to congratulate them once again, but for the school district as well, and thank the school district. They, they're cho they have chosen to engage with us. They have chosen to make this part of the enrichment that they offer to their students. And so, uh, if you will, one more time, the four students we have with us and our school district. And Ms. Brenda, thank you as always for making this happen. You're welcome. And I think, I think the students, because they spent some time with us today, if you don't mind, you might want to let them go ahead and go home and do their homework. <laughs> Indeed. If you wish to stay and your families wish to stay, you're welcome to do so. If you have catching up to do, I understand. You're welcome to go ahead and head home. Whatever you and the parents decide.
All right, very good. So thank you again. And then we're going to move on now to the next item that we have on our agenda, which is the 2019 Fire Prevention Poster Contest winners. Chief, how are you doing this evening? Good evening, Mayor and Council. Um, we had an exciting year this year. We had uh, 98 posters that were turned in this year for the fire prevention um, poster contest. We all met last Tuesday and had um, some council members and mayor and uh, a lot of city staff that showed up to help us judge um, all the posters. And so we're ready now to reveal the winners and reveal the mayor's choice um, at the end. So I'll turn it over to our fire marshal, Thomas Spencer. Good evening, everyone. Thank you for coming. I'm gonna come on down. Kids, when I call your names, please come up and we'll take a picture when you get your uh, trophy. Uh, we have first through third place through kindergarten through second. Third place is Jackson Boney. Well done. Well done. Second place. Desiree Ramirez. First place for second grade, Trent Rushaber. We're going to get into third and fourth grade division. Third place, third grade Rose Garden, Hudson Freeman. Second place, third grade Rose Garden, Jalon Smith. Jelani, right here. First place in the third and fourth grade division, third grade Rose Garden, Aiden Garza.
We only had one person put in for the fifth and sixth grader. That's fifth grade, Jordan Intermediate, Dayton Boney. Now, this last one, we do a special one. The mayor goes around, and he looks at everybody's poster, and he picks his own. So, mayor's choice, kindergarten, Pascal Elementary, Kilini Johnson. Thank you all for coming out. I just want to congratulate all, all the winners that are here this evening. And um, uh, we, we don't have any idea when, when we walk through whose poster is whose, right? All the names are on the back of them. We just see the work that's on top. And if you have a chance, the one that, that I chose is back here on the back wall. It's got a little bit of a, of a, of a gold... Uh, edge around it. It, it, it. it appears that they had an actual event, and, and the photographs talk about that event. I understand photographs don't talk, it's metaphorical. But seeing that spoke to me, because in my house when we had the one event that we had, uh, where we had to call the fire department, it was our stove top and oven as well. Uh, and I, I liked the, uh, the work that was done, uh, the detail that was put forth, and I, I just of all the ones that I saw, that one spoke to me because I had a similar incident in my house. So congratulations to you once again and to all the winners. Thank you for participating and coming to visit with us tonight. Well done. get all the winners to come out front we're going to take a quick group photo Same for all the winners of this contest. I understand that you may actually have homework and dinner and bedtime looming. So if you all need to go, you're welcome to do so. And we once again appreciate all of you joining us. All right. Good to see you. We're going to give all the families just a moment to, uh, to get out that want to. And then we'll continue with our uh, agenda.
All right, next up we have a few proclamations this evening. The first one is a proclamation recognizing the Comal Settlement Heritage Neighborhood. And before I read uh, the proclamation, we have a number of members here from our historical preservation team. Uh, that, that doesn't mean you get to embalm me quite yet. However, these folks do a great job. We, we, we started this back mid-2000s because we hadn't done anything formalized to preserve or to begin to collect things about the history of the city of Shirts. And we've come a very long way since then. You guys have done an exceptional job. And just on behalf of all of the residents and all the staff and the council here, thank you once again for what you've put together for us. It's exceptional. Indeed. Indeed. Now this is a rather lengthy proclamation. And I may not read all of it, but I will read each each of the original structures of the Comal settlement that are still standing. I will read out each one of those because they should be called out as they are part, an integral part of the history of this part of Texas. And it reads, whereas the Comal settlement is situated in the northeast sector of the city of Schertz within the territory of Comal County, Texas, the neighborhood is defined by boundaries that include territory north and south along a three-mile stretch of FM-482 originating in the east at the border of the community of Solms, Texas, and in the west at the border of the community of Bracken, Texas. The neighborhood is bordered on the north and south by Interstate Highway 35 uh, on the south and the geographical formation known as the Balcones Escarpment to the north. And whereas the settlement was established between 1846, I may read the whole thing now, this is good stuff, <laughs> was established between 1846 and 1849, and was one of the first rural farming communities created by original first founding families of New Braunfels, Texas. The cultivation of cotton as a cash crop brought economic prosperity to the settlement. The economic circumstance allowed for expansion of the small town's infrastructure by building its first cotton gin, corn shelling plant, a grain warehouse, a Catholic chapel, and expansion of its community school from one to a multi-room school structure. And whereas in 1881, International and Great Northern Railroad began transport through the settlement, followed by the Missouri-Kansas-Texas, or MKT Railroad, Railroad Company, in 1901, these railroads provided a vital economic assist to the community when cotton was king. And whereas the settlement was geographically placed amidst the historic roadway known as King's Highway, believed originally blazed around 1691, a portion of King's Highway as it passes through the area has also been known as Post Road. Today the road is known as Farm to Market, or FM 482. The above road and its supporting artery, Nacogdoches Road, are part of the National Historic El Camino de los Deas Trail. The trail was used by Native Americans transversing the Texas Plain as well as colonial Spanish missionaries and military troops traveling from Mexico to Northeast Texas to the Northeast Texas Territory. FM 482, originally a dirt pathway, was reconstructed between 1915 and 1917 as the first Texas joint Comal County and U.S. federal project. And whereas most of the original structures of the Comal settlement are still standing, and they follow as this. St. Joseph's Chapel, which was built around 1905 at 6400 FM 482. The chapel is of German architectural origins, the interior of which was totally restored in 2010 and 2011. July 28, 1886, Peter Ignaz Wenzel, a first founder of New Braunfels and Comal Settlement, donated two acres for construction of a private parochial school. The school's foundation remains next to the chapel. Wenzel St. Joseph Cemetery, from around 1884, at 6510 FM 482 in Shirts, Texas, the cemetery land was donated by Peter Wenzel's widow upon his death in 1884. The Neuper General Store, around 1907, at 6565 FM 482 here in Shirts. The Neuper Family Home, around 1920, at 6565 FM 482. Here in Schertz, and says this was the living quarters of one of the community's early settlement families. The Ferdinand Friesenhahn home, around 1911. The Schwab Wenzel blacksmith and mechanical shops, from around 1880. 
1915, both at 6515 482 in Shirts, Texas. The settlement's cotton gin and corn shelling plant, built in the 1890s and built by sons of Antonius and Anna Maria Friesenhan, the original, original settlers. The Danville Schoolhouse, which was built around 1920 at 7031 FM 482 here in Shirts. And this, this, this schoolhouse represented the first building within the settlement devoted to education, just as a schoolhouse. And the Alamo, Alamo Schutzen Verein Shooting Club facility, maybe one of my favorite places out there. It, they still use this from time to time. Built around 1940, and the club first began on an informal basis in approximately 1893 and utilized very far, various farm sites within the settlement to hold its competitions. Now, therefore, be it resolved in official recognition, I, Michael Carpenter, the mayor of the city of Schertz, hereby proclaim the Comal Settlement Heritage Neighborhood to be a key element of the history of the city of Schertz that should be recognized by the community. Anyone from, from the team that wants to come up and add or, or has, add some more? No? Nothing to add because I read the whole thing. I'll tell you what, if you haven't gone out there and taken a look, uh, there are some extraordinary buildings. The chapel is it's, 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 it's unique, and it, it stands out amongst everything in that area on 482. And if you go inside, the restoration work that's been done it was exceptional. And one of the things that stood out to me when I first got to go inside after the restoration, um, and for those of you who are Catholic, you'll, you'll immediately understand those of you who are not, catch me afterward, and I'll, I'll walk you through some of the, uh, the reasons behind. But... The Stations of the Cross that are there are, are, are from early on, and they still are written in German in the descriptions below them. There's no English uh, written uh, on, on any of it. So it's, it's, it's true to its heritage. You can, you can see the building. You can see where it was largely built by hand from stones in the area, and they used what they had. And it's, it's a remarkable testament to the hardiness of the people that were here a uh, hundred and forty years ago. It's amazing. It's been that long and further back from there. So if you get a chance to go see, please do. Uh, and if you have any questions, ask the team. They know far more than what I can just read on a proclamation. So that said, if you guys will come forward, I'm present this to you. All right, next up we have a proclamation recognizing the VFW, the Shirts VFW, right down the street here, um, and li as it lives up to its motto, to honor the dead by helping the living with the sale of small red flowers, poppies. And Mike, you here? Mr. Espinola is not here. Not a problem. I'll read the proclamation just the same. By the way, I've had many an opportunity to... Uh, to visit at the VFW. I've been invited to speak a number of times at, at different events. And, and th these folks do an exceptional job in honoring uh, all of our military, everyone who has served in any conflict at any time. They're there to help, they're there to support. And uh, if you do have an opportunity to go to any of the event events that they put on, it's well worth your time and a patriotic thing to do. So I'll read this to you here, and it reads, Whereas the annual distribution of buddy poppies by the veterans of foreign wars of the United States has been officially recognized and endorsed by governmental leaders since 1922, and whereas VFW buddy poppies are assembled by disabled veterans and the proceeds of this worthy fundraising campaign are used exclusively for the benefit of disabled and needy veterans and the widows and orphans of deceased veterans, and whereas the buddy poppy small red flower, symbolic of the blood shed in World War I by millions of Allied soldiers in defense of freedom, was originally sold to provide relief for the people of war-devastated war France. And whereas the basic purpose of the annual distribution of buddy poppies by the veterans of foreign wars is eloquently reflected in the desire to honor the dead by helping the living. 
Therefore, I, Michael Carpenter, Mayor of the City of Shirts, do hereby urge the citizens of this community to recognize the merits of this cause by contributing generously to its support. That your donations for Buddy Poppies on the day set aside for the distribution of these symbols of appreciation for the sacrifices of our honored dead. I urge all patriotic citizens to wear a Buddy Poppy as evidence of our gratitude to the men and women of this country who have risked their lives in defense of the freedoms which we continue to enjoy as citizens of this republic. So I know that they're not here this evening, but a round of applause, if we will, for the work that they do at the VFW. All right, next up this evening, we have a number of employee recognitions. I'm going to start off this evening with facility services. Good evening, Council, Mayor, Dr. Brown. You, you, you can angle that up. I'm, I'm just about, I'm about this there tall. Nice. There you go. Um, I'd like to introduce um, Chad, Chad Lonsberg, Barry. He's our new HVAC tech. Uh, I think this is one of the first ones for the city. We're very excited to have him, and um, he's making a great um, impact on the city already. I was talking to one of our um, computer techs. He said he really hit his hit the ground running, hit the ground on his feet, which is great. He comes from us um, from a family of HVAC techs. His dad is HVAC and teaches HVAC, so it runs in their blood. Um, he grew up in shirts, uh, went to Clemens High School. Go bus. Buffaloes. <laughs> and um, he's making all our buildings more comfortable. Fantastic. First of all, welcome. Glad to have you with us. And everybody that comes forward has an opportunity to speak at the microphone. It is not mandatory. But if you like to, please. You're good. All right, listen. We're happy to have you with us. I hope you have a long career with us here at the City of Shirts. Thank welcome you. again. Indeed. Next up. Parks, Recreation, and Community Services. Mr. Mayor, Council Members, Dr. Brown, I'm Jared Motney, your Parks Manager. I want to introduce you to our newest park maintenance worker, Rowdy Clark. He comes from Denton, Texas. Um, he went to school at Midwestern University in Wichita Falls, uh, where he received his bachelor's in criminal justice. Um, he played two years of college football and uh, succumbed to some injuries. Um, he has a German shepherd named Maya, which I thought was interesting. Um, loves to fish, kayak, um, has traveled to 38 of the 50 states and plans to finish the rest of them uh, later in his career. And um, the last thing I wanted to mention, uh, per capita, the Parks Department now is the tallest department in the city. Did y'all catch that? Said person for person, the Parks Department has the tallest group in the city. So first of all, welcome. I'm glad to have you with us. And please. And, uh, answer to normal questions. Uh, yes, my name is actually Rowdy. Uh, it's from the old TV show Rawhide with Clint Eastwood. Many of you all familiar. And also, uh, I have been known to get Rowdy. Fantastic. Well, welcome to the City of Shirts, and we hope you have a long career here with us. Good stuff. All right, next up, Police Department. Evening, how are y'all? Hello, uh, Mayor, Council Members. Sorry, it's been a long day. All um, good. I'm here to introduce Jordan Flores. She's our newest uh, telecommunications officer. Um, she just turned 21 and had an exciting weekend. Um, she, her hometown is Travis Air Force Base in California. She does come from an Air Force family. Um, she grew up primarily in Japan at multiple uh, institutions there. Um, one interesting fact about her is that with all that traveling that she's done, Texas and this area is her favorite. Um, she's 
started September 16th. And there we go. First of all, welcome. <laughs> anything you'd like to say? It isn't mandatory. It's up to you. Yeah. Happy to have you too. <laughs> um, I'll just say I had a really warm welcome for working for the uh, City of Shirts. The police department has been really nice to me, and I know it's an honor to be working for you all. So. Wonderful. We are thrilled to have you with us on the team. Please. Rowdy, when, you were, when I got your badge to enter, I thought, no way. The old wrestling Rowdy Piper, I, w I had to call and find out what was going on. <laughs> Put a name to the, the face. Good stuff. Good stuff. All right, next up, Public Works. Good evening, Mayor, Councilman, evening. Dr. Brown. Uh, my name is Doug Lebetter, Public Works Manager. Um, start off with Robert Mata here. <clears throat> he came as a, as a street worker one. As his position consists of concrete work, crack ceiling, street work, and many, many other things that do come up in Public Works. Uh, Robert started with the city September 6th, 16th. <clears throat> Uh, Robert was born in Oxnard, California, and lived there for six years. Then moved to San Antonio, uh, where he currently resides. He went to Neal Elementary, went to middle school at Whitt Whittier Middle School, and graduated from Thomas Edison High School in 2011. <clears throat> he is currently living in San Antonio with his fiance, Jasmine. Robert has three kids, Lorena, six, Sophia, five, and Felix has just turned one. Y'all are going to love this. He likes hunting, fishing, and skeet shooting. Love it. Everybody from Public Works does. <laughs> okay, we have Isaac Rodriguez. He's also street worker one. He started on the 19th and consists of the same exact things. Anything that comes up, we take care of. Uh, Isaac was born in San Antonio and has lived there for the last 32 years. He went to Candlewood Elementary Middle school was Kirby and graduated from Judson High School in 2007. He, he is currently living in San Antonio with his wife, Chelsea, and have two boys, excuse me, <coughs> Cameron nine and Christopher four. He likes hunting, fishing, family time, and being involved with his son's football team. Fantastic. Gentlemen, welcome to both of you. I'll take it. That means you don't need any time at the microphone. Welcome, gentlemen. Hope you'd have, with, have you with us for a long time. All right, next up, utility billing. Good evening, Mayor, Dr. Brown, City Council. Um, I would like to introduce Melissa Gomez. She was um, born and raised in the valley, the southern tip of Texas. She worked with the City of Mission um, in the City Secretary Department until her employment with the City of Shirts. She also worked with other cities and county agencies. Um, she decided to make the move to Shirts after her parents moved here two years ago. Um, she fell in love with the city due to its beauty, respectable community, and better opportunity for herself. Um, Melissa is gr very grateful for the opportunity to be employed with the City of Shirts. She also wants to thank her husband, her children, and her parents for all of their support that they have given her throughout this process. First of all, welcome. <laughs> Glad to have you with us. Thank you. All good. All right. Listen, we're happy to have you on the team with us. Hope you'll stay with us for a long time. All right, next up, public affairs. Hello everyone, I'm Devin Flores, Public Affairs um, Department Communications Manager, and I'm introducing uh, Madison Porras, who is our new uh, Marketing and Communications Specialist. She started on September 3rd. Uh, she's been doing an awesome job for us so far. Um, we're excited to have her. Um, she was born in Dallas, Texas, and grew up in Atlanta and San Antonio. Uh, she went to Johnson High School, graduated from UTSA in 2000, or 2017, uh, with a degree in communication studies. 
Um, she does freelance graphic design uh, for many organizations, including the um, nonprofits and the San Antonio, um, City of San Antonio Planning Department. Um, she's the youngest of three sisters, um, and she's a proud parent to an eight-year-old boxer pit bull mix and two turtles. <laughs> Um, she loves going to concerts. She's a big fan of San Antonio uh, Football Club and watching soccer. Uh, she's an avid moviegoer, a plant lover, and amateur woodworker. Great. Well, first of all, welcome. Glad to have you with us today. Time at the microphone. <laughs> sure. Um, I've been here about a month and a half, and I just wanted to say thank you to everyone. Everyone's been really welcoming to me, and, and I've had a good time being here. Great. Welcome. Happy to have you with us on the team. Good stuff. All right. Next up on the agenda, we have announcements of upcoming city events. Good evening, Elm. Mayor, Council. We have the City of Shirts is holding a ge joint general and special election on November 5th, 2019, for the purpose of electing council members for place one, place two, and for mayor, and for a special election to fill the vacancy of the unexpired term for council member place four. Early voting began Monday, October 21st and continues through November the 1st, 2019. Information regarding early voting and election day voting centers for Kamal, Guadalupe, and Bear County is available on the city's website and in the October Shirts Magazine. On Saturday, October 26th, we have the Community Shred event, free on-site shredding services for the residents of Shirts at 125 Pecan Drive from 9 a.m. to 1 p.m. And then the season's festive trunk or treat at Pickerel Park that evening from 5 p.m. to 8 p.m. It's a safe trick or treat, costume contest, scary hayride, zombie laser tag, spooky house, and much more. On Monday, October 28th, we have the candlelight vigil to honor lives lost due to domestic violence at Pickerel Park, small pavilion at 6.30 p.m. Attendees are asked to wear purple in support. And finally, on Tuesday, November 5th, we have the city council meeting has been canceled due to the election day. Oh, and one last addition. On Saturday, November the 9th, we have the fire station number three grand opening from 11 to 2 at 11917 Lower Seguin. There's parking at Corbett Junior High, and we'll have shuttle services to make it easy to get to station three. That's all I have, sir. Good deal. Thank you, sir. Next up, announcements and recognitions by the city manager. Dr. Brown? I uh, have nothing tonight, Mayor. All right, next up, announcements and recognitions by the mayor. I'm also uh, don't have anything this evening, so we're going to move to hearing of residents. And what I'm, I'm going to um, uh, go a little bit out of order, and I'm going to invite Juliana and Kaylin up first. Two of you or just one? Just one. Well, the microphone is yours. Good afternoon. My name is Juliana Kirk. Uh, Kaylin couldn't make it today, but I'm here to talk to y'all about the um, leadership events that we're doing for Kung Jun Musul of Shirts. And right now in the month of October, which is Breast Cancer Awareness Month, we're raising money for the Alamo Breast Cancer Foundation. And so far we've had women's self-defense classes, three of them, and we have one left. So um, it's for men and women. So if y'all want to come out and be a part of that, that'd be great. Uh, we've also had a booth at, we also had a booth at the Cibolo Fest, uh, also raising money for them. We're going to have a booth at um, the, Balloon, the Balloon Skylight Festival, and we are hosting a um, Monster Mash costume party at our school on November 1st, and that's the last day to donate to them through us. So if any of y'all want to come out and be a part of that, that would also be great. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Did you do all that with no notes? I'm sorry, what? You did all that with no notes? Oh, I just memorized it. Good for you. <laughs> Nicely done. <laughs> thank you. All right, thank you. Good. All right, I'm going to go back to the top of the list. And first uh, listed this evening is uh, Frank, and I, and I apologize. Is that Frank Santa Maria? Please. Good evening, gentlemen. I am a new resident of Shirts. I have been here since May the 1st. And I am extremely concerned about the water bills that I'm receiving and the lack of pressure I'm receiving. I have talked to two of the council members about this. I hear complaints within my community 
I hear complaints at the Senior Citizen Center, which I volunteer at, and, and various other residents in shirts. <clears throat> the excuses, if you will, for lack of a better term, that uh, I am hearing is that we have new meters. We're not sure that the meters are accurate. Uh, if you have a water softener, it, it uh, has an effect on the pressure of the water. And what else did I hear from the water department? Oh, um, as the tower fills up, the pressure goes down, which makes sense. But, you know, I'll be in the shower at 11 o'clock in the morning or 11 o'clock at night. I can't believe that that water tower is filling up both of those times. Uh, my, elect my electric bill for this month was $105. My water bill was $95. I don't see the justification in the light bill running the air conditioner uh, offsets the $6 difference in the two. And, and I, I, I'm not really sure um, who's, who, who the onus is upon to try to get this uh, problem resolved for all the citizens that and I'm sure all of you have heard complaints about this, okay? Um, bottom line, what's being done? Got it. Uh, Is we, there anything being done? What I, while we don't, we actually do have this on the agenda for later on this evening. We do have a presentation from staff this evening with regard to what they've found as we've asked them to look into the matter around the city and see what <clears> they've <throat> discovered, both from the, uh, um, any effects that might have occurred from the replacement of the older water meters to anything that may have, we also had a water main break up here on Shirts Parkway twice uh, in the last two months, which would had deleterious effects on pressure. So there'll be a presentation from staff later on in this meeting with regard to what they've found. So will those findings be revealed? Uh, they will be here in open session and will, it will be on the recording as well. Is that today? That is this evening. Oh, okay. I'm sorry. I misunderstood. No, no, no problem. I'll stick around. <laughs> Thank Very you. Very good. Yes, sir. All right. Next up, Joyce Briscoe. Good evening, Mayor Carpenter, City Council members, and uh, Mr. Brown, our city manager. My Good evening, Ms. Briscoe. For those of you that don't know, this, this nice young lady served years uh, on our board of trustees at, this, at our school district and was instrumental in bringing a lot of uh, success and improvements therein. So first of all, thank you for your service. Well, thank you we for your kind it. words. My name is Joyce Briscoe, and I'm a 39-year proud resident of the great city of Schertz, as well as a taxpayer. <laughs> This evening, I want to speak to you about the Shirts Area Senior Center. My first comment is one of thanks to all of you and to the taxpayers of Shirts for providing a senior center uh, for the area seniors to enjoy the one, uh, to enjoy one or more of the 80 activities that are currently provided at the center, including the free lunch program for persons 50 years of age and older. The contract the city made with the YMCA to operate the center has been an extremely successful partnership. Awesome. The programs have been so well received that the Silver Sneakers exercise programs have outgrown the area available for them. To alleviate the overcrowding in this program, the YMCA has graciously added three additional classes and approves senior members to attend the two sneakers programs that are offered at the Cibolo YMCA. The lunch program will soon extend to the neighboring room to accommodate the increased number of attendees. This will divide the congregants and limit the interaction among participants, especially during the very popular bingo games. However, these are temporary solutions to the problem of increasing participation. As more baby boomers age into a need for senior services and the area population continues to grow, current space is not going to accommodate all who want to attend one or more of the activities at the center. The increase in participation at the center brings me to my second comment, and that is to advise you that now is the time to begin planning for the future of the Schertz Area Senior Center. 
Church taxpayers have long borne the entire funding for the area center. Now that expansion of the facilities is upon us, it seems imperative to me to include area neighbors in the dialogue of how to fund for future space management and programs, thereby hopefully reaching a more equitable outcome with interlocal agreements. In conclusion, I want to thank those of you who responded to my uh, emails uh, of the information that I took from the presentation uh, given to the uh, Cibolo Council approximately one year ago by our Parks and Recreations Director. That presentation was made to the Cibolo Council uh, at the request of this council uh, to direct her to ask Cibolo to contribute to the food program. It is my understanding that that presentation was not presented to the Shirts Council. There's a lot of good information in there. At this time, I want to ask the Council for an agenda item within the next two months that will update and expand the information and allow Council to provide a way forward to address the issues facing the Shirts Area Senior Center. Thank you for listening to my comments this evening. Thank you, Ms. Briscoe. Appreciate it. All right, next up, Maggie Tudorgan from the Chamber. Good evening, Council. Uh, as referenced earlier, we do have a hot air balloon festival, our third annual one. It begins this Friday and goes through Sunday. Uh, the hours are Friday 5 to 9.30. Saturday from 7.30 in the morning until 9.30 at night, and Sunday from 7.30 in the morning till 12.30 in the afternoon. And uh, we have, we're so excited, and I wasn't sure if I had shared this with you all before, but Glenn Moyer, who is the MC and the official host for the Albuquerque Hot Air Balloon Festival, is our MC for the balloons. He's coming in and very excited about that. Uh, we're having a lot of return pilots. We have three international balloons coming in, and one that got officially revealed, I found out, supposed to be at ours, but at Albuquerque, but will be re-revealed only for the second time at our festival uh, this weekend. And it is only $20 for a carload of up to five people to come. If you have up to eight people in your car, then it is only $30. That gets you into the grounds, gets you into the concerts, live concerts all weekend long. Uh, we have skydivers. We actually, for our opening ceremonies on Friday, have a T6 uh, T flyover as the parachuters from Remax are skydiving down. So I, I don't know the logistics of that, but Randolph and, and, and Remax skydivers are working that out. But it'll be a really great event, very affordable, very family budgeted friendly, and also the very first uh, and original, probably not the first, but of more to come, it's a three city event. We have the support of Shirt, Cibolo, and Selma. They have large booths that are participating, over 121 vendors that are gonna have 21 food trucks, as well as arts, crafts, I mean, you name it, this place has got it all in one place. And I checked the weather, I know people have been giving me a hard time, beautiful. It's going to be a beautiful weekend. Sun's coming out, cold front's coming in, so lows in the uh, 50s, highs in the 70s. Perfect hot air balloon weather. So please come on out. Uh, everybody within the sound of my voice, come on out. It'll be a great time. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Indeed. All right, Kathy Marston. Good evening. Good evening. Um, I have packets that I made. I made nine of them. Do I give them to the city secretary? I'll, okay. I'll take them here and we'll pass them down both directions. Quite all right. We, we will share if need be. So I, I want to thank Mr. Gutierrez for inviting me um, and uh, some of my um, cohorts to come and I want to thank Mr. Edwards for following up with me um, as well after I met him at the Meet the Candidate event. Um, I am here tonight to talk to y'all about fair chance hiring, a fair chance ordinance, and I'm going to go out of order of my notes um, <laughs> to tell you first who I am. Um, my uh, family has lived in shirts since 1982 uh, when my dad retired from Randolph. And then I graduated valedictorian from Randolph in 1986. 
I went on to Trinity University, earned a bachelor's degree, cum laude, got a master's in journalism at UT Austin, worked at the newspaper there, and went up to Iowa and got a PhD up there. And um, in 2004, I had to defend myself against an abusive ex-boyfriend. And um, I went to prison for that, and I came home five years ago in July 2014. I uh, paroled out, and I completed my parole in uh, January 2015. I live with my dad. He's still in the same house. He's 80 years old now. And um, I founded Free Battered Texas Women, which is a group that uh, raises awareness about the high wrongful arrest rate of battered women here in, the, in Texas and advocates for clemency for battered women and supports them in their reentry. So I have been home for five years with a doctorate and a couple of decades of professional communication experience and university level teaching experience and I cannot find sustainable employment because of legal discrimination against people uh, with felony records in hiring. Uh, so uh, that's one of the reasons I prepared this packet for y'all tonight. Uh, in here you're going to find two items and I apologize for not being having the time to write a white paper to sort of lay out um, some bullet points for you but let me give you some statistical bullet points. The Equal Justice Initiative says that one-third of all adults in the United States have a criminal record, one-third. The Texas Criminal Justice Coalition writes that the unemployment rate among formerly incarcerated individuals is nearly five times higher than among the general population. That's in your packet. That's one of the items in there uh, that's titled 2019 Legislation, Improved Access to Employment and Economic Opportunity. Um, uh, there's more statistics that are in that first paragraph there in the City of Austin Ordinance, uh, Fair Chance Ordinance, uh, which I've also included in your packet. It goes on to have similar findings, so I'm just going to pop a couple of points off that. They found that denying an employment opportunity to otherwise qualified person based on the person's criminal history that is not relevant to the job under consideration, number one, is unjust. Two, is detrimental to the health, safety, and welfare of the residents of the city. Three, prevents reintegration into the community. Four, creates a burden on public resources and law enforcement. Five, contributes to crime and recidivism. And six, contributes to unemployment and harms the local economy. Sort of my last bullet point um, uh, is that the San Antonio area that has the highest poverty rate in the state. So, I would like to urge the council to consider a fair chance ordinance, uh, urge the chamber uh, to consider joining in on that, and urge anyone who might be running for county office, for example, I'd like to urge the county uh, to help uh, support this. I would like to contribute more to my community. Um, uh, I spoke to the chamber president a couple of weeks ago, and I told her that my, my unincorporated nonprofit, we may not have gotten as far as we have um, if I had been able to find uh, sustainable employment. But uh, I want to thank you all. If there's any questions that anybody has or any way that I can serve uh, in helping with this, I'd like to do so. When we had our monthly meeting for FBTW today, I read off the uh, city core values, the do the right thing, do the best you can, treat others the way you want to be treated, and work cooperatively as a team. So I hope this is my, me stepping up to be a team member. And uh, I remember that uh, I'd like for you to think just for a second about the worst thing you ever did, and would you want that to get in the way of what you have to do for the rest of your life to support yourself and your family? And then there are other factors in the criminal justice system that, that uh, uh, mean that there are groups that are disadvantaged because of gender, because of color of the skin, because of economics. Um, once that system is interacted with. Thank you all so much. I, I, um, I invited some other people. Uh, one of them is going to follow me here. My um, financial um, officer for Free Better Texas Women, her mom who lives around the corner from me, had a medical emergency and she apologizes for not being able to make it today. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Next up, Bonnie Marston. Good evening. Um, I'm here to just, I guess, give personal testimony about how the Fair Chance Ordinance is a step in the right direction. 
Um, I graduated from Randolph High School in 1987, third in my class. I graduated with a vocal performance degree summa, summa cum laude in 1993 from Southwest Texas State University, and I have three and a half years of graduate studies under my belt. In 2000, I received a felony charge. I have been applying for employment in shirts in the surrounding areas since 2003. Most recently, I applied and interviewed at World Market at the Forum and the new 3009 restaurant at the HEB, but was not hired. Um, I have been employed at Pizza Italia since October of 2003 and have never been given a raise above minimum wage. Um, this is the only job that will hire me now. I used to teach voice, piano, and percussion lessons at San Marcos High School and in Austin upon my graduation from college in 1993. But now, because of cr my criminal background, I can no longer teach in schools, work at the YMCA, or get a nursing, physical therapy, or massage therapy certificates, which were goals of mine. Um, I've had to commute to Jones Maltzberger in Thousand Oaks, which is near 281 and 1604, um, five nights a week since 2003 to earn money to pay bills and to buy a car. Um, almost every day there are wrecks, and as the years have passed, traffic has gotten worse on I-35 and 1604. Um, we really need to eliminate discrimination against people with conviction records, and I believe that fair chance ordinance is a step in the right direction. Thank you. Thank you. All right, I didn't have anyone else sign up this evening, so we're going to move forward with the uh, business part of the meeting. First item that I have tonight are the consent agenda items, and they are as follows. One, approval of the minutes of the regular meeting of September 24, 2019. Number two, resolution 19R143, a resolution by the City Council of City of Shirts, Texas, authorizing a personal services agreement with Chairman Sanchez for services related to marketing and developing certain city property for the purpose of the installation and operation of wireless communications equipment and systems and the continued management of the city's telecommunications tenants and other matters in connection therewith. Item number three, resolution 19R145, a resolution by the City Council of City of Shirts, Texas, authorizing a public library interlocal agreement with Guadalupe County, Texas, and other matters in connection therewith. Item number four, resolution 19R140, a resolution by the City Council of City of Shirts, Texas, authorizing contracts totaling no more than $100,000 with SA Paramount Construction, LLC, for labor and related materials for various separate and unrelated concrete-related projects during the 2019-2020 fiscal year and other matters in connection therewith. Item number five, resolution 19R128, a resolution by the City Council of City of Shirts, Texas, authorizing a drainage easement through dedicated public parkland for the Rhine Valley Unit 3B development. Item number six, resolution 19R144, a resolution by the City Council of the City of Shirts, Texas, authorizing amendment number three to the economic development incentive agreement among the City of Shirts, the City of Shirts Economic Development Corporation, Guadalupe County, and Amazon.com Services Incorporated and other matters in connection therewith. Item number seven, resolution 19R146, approving a bond resolution adopted by the Board of Directors of the Shirts Seguin Local Government Corporation, authorizing the issuance of obligations designated as Shirts Seguin Local Government Corporation Contract Revenue Refunding Bonds, Series 2019, San Antonio Water System Expansion Water Treatment Project 2, acknowledging that these obligations were sold to the authorized representative of a group of underwriters identified in the preliminary official statement pursuant to the provisions of a purchase contract, ratifying reconfirming and readopting the provisions of a mutual region, regional water supply contract executed between the City of Shirts, Texas, the City of Seguin, Texas, the Shirts Seguin Local Government, Co Government Corporation, and the City of San Antonio, Texas, acting by and through its San Antonio water system, authorizing the mayor, the city secretary, and or the city manager of the City of Shirts, Texas, to execute on behalf of the City of Shirts, Texas, all documents in connection with this transaction and other matters in connection therewith. Item number eight, resolution 19R105, a resolution by the City Council of the City of Shirts, Texas, approved a resolution authorizing the city manager to enter into an agreement with Babcock Road 165 Limited for reimbursement for a roadway extension to Rips Chrysler. Item number nine, resolution 19R147, a resolution by the City Council of City of Shirts, Texas, authorizing a roadway capital recovery offset agreement with ILFNT owner LP 
for roadway impact fee credits for the extension of system roadways and other matters in connection therewith. Item number 10, resolution 19R141, a resolution by the City Council of the City of Church, Texas, authorizing a roadway capital recovery offset agreement with ILF NT owner LP for roadway impact fee credits for the extension of a system roadways, I'm sorry, of system roadways and other matters in connection therewith. Item number 11, Ordinance 19S25 on final reading, an ordinance by the City Council of City of Shirts, Texas to approve a specific use permit to allow for operation of a convenience store with gas pumps on approximately 8.5 acres of land, more specifically described as the northwest corner of the intersection between Interstate Highway 35 and Schwab Road, City of Shirts, Comal County, Texas. Again, final reading. Item number 12, Resolution 19R142, a resolution of the City Council of City of Shirts, Texas, authorizing the revised bylaw laws of the Planning and Zoning Commission and other matters in connection therewith, and item number 13, cancellation of the November 26, 2019 City Council meeting. Council, any of these that need to be pulled and considered individually? Hearing none, I'm going to move from the chair that we approve all items on consent as presented. Second. I have a uh, motion from the chair, a second from Mr. Edwards. Any other comments, questions from Council? I'm hearing none. I'll call for a vote. Aye. 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 I have seven ayes, no nays. The motion carries. All right, discussion and action items. Item number 14, Ordinance 19M28, an ordinance by the City Council, uh, rather, an ordinance by the City of Shirts authorizing and authorizing and amending the City Council rules of conduct and procedure, repealing all ordinances or parts of ordinances in conflict with this ordinance and providing an effective date and declaring an emergency. This will be a first and final reading. Mrs. Dennis? Yes, sir. Um, as you know, you know uh, there was a House Bill uh, 2840 that was passed that you know, talked about the, um, um, uh, how to, uh, I'm sorry, that talked about, um, you know, how to, ad the addressing of the citizens to be heard. In that, there's, there was several paragraphs in your council's code of ordinances, I mean, excuse me, a code of conduct and procedures that needed to be reviewed, which was reviewed by legal. Legal has uh, provided you with the revisions, and the reason why we're asking for first and final reading is because this House bill was passed on September 1st. Indeed. Uh, I, I had a chance to review these. They look pretty ministerial to me. Council, any questions on this one? Mr. Mayor, I'd like to make a motion that we approve ordinance number 19M28. Second. I have a motion for Mr. Edwards, a second for Mr. Davis. Any other comments, questions from Council? You're now call for a vote. Aye. 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 Seven ayes and no nays. The motion carries. Thank you. Next up, we have a public hearing on Ordinance 19S27. It's an ordinance by the City Council of the City of Shirts, Texas, amending the official zoning map by rezoning approximately 27 acres of land from General Business District, GB, and Manufacturing Light District, or M1, to Plan Development District, PDD, located at 17975 IH35, City of Shirts, Guadalupe County, Texas. Evening, sir. How are you? Good evening. Good. How are you? Good, good. Uh, Nick Copier, Planning Department. Uh, like the mayor said, this is a zone change for approximately 27 acres uh, from GB and M12 Plan Development District. Uh, just for your reference, this is the subject property here outlined, outlined in green. Um, this is I-35. It's situated about halfway between uh, FM309 and then Silbo Valley Drive. Uh, public hearing notices were sent in preparation for the meeting. Staff received one response um, in favor of the zone change. Uh, here's the current zoning map of the area. <coughs> uh, location of the subject properties indicate the gold star. As you can see, it's currently zoned general business district and manufacturing light. Um, and the surrounding properties are also uh, manufacturing light and general business district. Um, the North Shirt sector plan designates this area as both highway commercial uh, and mixed use neighborhood. The proposed changes to the pr uh, permitted land uses uh, in the development standards are compatible with the highway commercial designation. So the proposed zone change is in general conformance with the comp plan. Um, the overall proposal is to zone change 27 acres of land, uh, zone GB and M1 to Plan Development District. Um, under these development standards, what you can see here on the screen, uh, subject property is going to have two base zoning districts. Uh, the portion of the property in front of Four Oaks Lane, so this is the proposed Four Oaks Lane, whose general alignment was established during a preliminary pr process for the Dollar General, um, and this is I-35 here. The portion in front of Four Oaks Lane will have a base zoning of general business. Um, and the portion behind Four Oaks Lane will have a base zoning of manufacturing light. Uh, this split follows the natural break of the commercial collector and also closely mirrors what we currently have in our uh, zoning map. So the First Amendment proposed in these development standards is regarding the permitted land uses. 
Um, the area with a base zoning of M1 that you saw behind Four Oaks Lane will not have any additional land uses permitted and will function as M1 does today. And the area with base zoning of GB will be allowed to utilize the office warehouse distribution center and storage wholesale warehouse land uses uh, by right. So currently, just black is current and then orange is proposed through this PDD. Uh, the office warehouse distribution center is permitted by right in GB2 and M1. And through the development standards, it would also be permitted by right in GB. Storage wholesale warehouse permitted with an SUP in GB and by right in GB2 and M1. And with this PDD, it also be permitted by right in GB, GB2, and M1. Um, so as you can see with the current zoning map, this property marks a clear transition between the existing industrial land um, to the northwest of the property and the commercial along the I-35 corridor. Uh, typically, GB2 is an appropriate zoning district to mark this transition. Uh, however, there are several land uses on GB2 that would not necessarily be appropriate for a property with 35 frontage. And so from a staff perspective, these unique circumstances uh, lend themselves to a plan development district where we can create uh, zoning regulations that are a good fit for the subject property and this transition area where these two additional land uses are appropriate. So the second proposed change um, under the development standards is to the landscaping regulations. And as you can see uh, on screen, all the typical landscaping regulations uh, from the site plan uh, process for commercial development are included in this PDD uh, to have upgraded standards. And these regulations include base lands landscape installation, parking area landscaping, uh, and perimeter landscaping. Uh, so the first one I want to point out to is the uh, landscape buffer along principal and secondary arterials. Um, this requirement has been upsized from two and a half caliper inch trees to four inch trees. Um, and due to the uh, increase in density, the, uh, or due to the increase in size, the density requirement has been reduced from one per 20 to one per 40 to give each tree a chance to thrive. Um, these trees are also required to be installed prior to any building permits. So the first thing you're going to see with this property before any building permits can be pulled is the installation of this landscaping along I-35. Um, other landscaping requirements that you can see here all include upsized landscaping. So essentially the trees are going from two and a half caliper inches required to four caliper inches required, and the shrubs are going from one gallon to three gallon. Essentially just an upgraded upsized landscaping requirements. Um, the, uh, the increased requirements will allow the landscaping to look more natural and established, and the difference is potentially worth years of growth, years of growth uh, from the proposed and current trees. I just wanted to include this here real quick. This is a picture of the current landscaping um, along 35, which is, as you can see, is uh, non-existent. Um, the required four-inch trees uh, will provide an immediate benefit to the city along 35, and the other requirements will apply to all new buildings and other landscaped areas to uh, ensure that the higher landscaping standards are carried into the future. And following the approval of House Bill 2439, hopefully uh, the increased landscaping regulations defined in this PDD will mitigate some of the lost aesthetic regulations now that we can no longer control uh, exterior, more stringent exterior con uh, construction material standards. Um, the Planning and Zoning Commission uh, met in September and uh, recommended approval by a six to one vote, and staff is recommending approval of the proposed zone change to PDD um, for its immediate and future city benefit from increased landscaping standards, uh, the transitional nature of the site between commercial and industrial land uses, and the existing conditions of the development on site. Uh, the applicant is here to answer any questions if you have any. All right, very good. This is set for a public hearing, so at this time I'm going to um, begin that process. The um, request from me is if you do decide you want to come forward and speak, if you would give your name and your address for the city secretary to capture for the minutes. I uh, ask that you keep your commentary to roughly three minutes or thereabouts. Uh, if you need a little more time, I've got some leeway as the chair and can grant that, but would like to keep things uh, moving through the meeting. So that said, I'm going to go ahead and open the public hearing. Anybody that would like to address the council at this time may come forward and do so on this item. I don't see anyone jumping up out of their seats or getting up slowly as I might. If uh, I don't have any takers, and I'm going to go ahead and close the public hearing. All right, public hearing is closed. I'm going to open it up to council. Council, questions on this one? Anyone? Mr. Edwards? No? Uh, in that case, I'm going to move from the chair that we approve ordinance 19S27 on first reading. Second. I have a motion from the chair, a second from Mr. Edwards. Any other comments or questions from council? Hearing none, I'll call for a vote. Aye. 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 I have seven ayes, no nays. The motion carries. Thank you very much. Next item that we have on the agenda is a roll call vote confirmation. Yes, Mayor. Uh, consent agenda items 
1 through 13. The motion was made by the chair, seconded by Council Member Edwards. Mayor Pro Tem Brown, Council Members Davis Gutierrez, Larson Edwards, Scagliola and Hayward voted yes, no one voted no. Motion passed. Item number 14, ordinance number 19M18, first and final. Motion was made by Council Member Edwards, seconded by Council Member Davis. Mayor Pro Tem Brown, Council Members Davis, Gutierrez, Larson, Edwards, Scagliola, and Hayward voted yes, no one voted no. Motion passed. Item number 15, ordinance number 19S27 on first reading. Motion was made by the chair, seconded by Council Member Edwards. Mayor Pro Tem Brown, Council Members Davis, Gutierrez, Larson, Edwards, Scagliola, and Hayward voted yes, no one voted no. Motion passed. Thank you, ma'am. All right, next up, we have two workshops this evening. The first one uh, with regard to water meters. There's a workshop and discussion on the new water meters and bill amounts uh, that we've seen in August and September. Uh, Mr. Walters, are you going to lead us on this one? All right. Very good. The floor is yours. All right. Good evening, Mayor and Council. My name is James Walters. I am the Finance Director here for the City of Shirts. So I'm going to start uh, the discussion by going through a history of uh, where we were um, back in 2017 and 18. Um, we started to see some uh, the warranties expire on the previous generation of water meters. Uh, they had about a 10-year full warranty, and they started to go out. Um, a lot of the signal batteries started to die, uh, which meant our meter technicians were taking longer and longer to actually read meters. Uh, they have to physically get out and actually look at the meter uh, instead of just the, using the drive-by system that we had previously. Uh, during this time, the customers experienced late bills or bills that were estimated. Uh, bills were gener uh, generally estimated low as to not to overcharge customers, um, but this may have customers to believe their water usage was lower than it actually was during that time. Uh, staff removed late penalties and did not turn off water accounts for non-payment around this time as well as we went through that transition. Uh, so uh, with those challenges, staff began researching different options uh, to replace and update our, our metering system. Uh, we published an RFP and issued some uh, $4 million of bonds for the project. Uh, from this RFP, staff received multiple bids and ultimately uh, uh, we came to council and uh, had approved a contract for HydroPro Solutions uh, to purchase the equipment and install the 14,000-ish uh, meters. Uh, HydroPro subcontracted with uh, PMI, Professional Meter inst um, Installers, to perform the actual installations. Uh, PMI began changing out meters around the first of the year. Uh, this became the first phase of the project. Uh, the change-out process took about 15 to 30 minutes, and door hangers were left on uh, residents' uh, homes whenever meters actually changed. Uh, PMI actually finished installing their meters in July 2019. You see, uh, started in January. Um, we peaked around March and April. We actually extended that, their time frame to work on Saturdays at that time to help get through this process as fast as possible. Uh, we completed their portion of it in July. Uh, after July, uh, city staff began work to installing the remaining 300-ish meters uh, that needed, uh, either needed work done on the meter box as it wouldn't fit, we needed to clear out, dig some holes, or, or do some maintenance on the meter box, or swap it out. Um, or these were new addresses that uh, came on to the city before we, uh, after we'd done the RFP, uh, but before we started the swap out, so um, they had the old meters as well. Uh, to date, the city has about 167 meters left to install citywide, and we anticipate completion by the end of the year. Uh, so these new meters send uh, water usage data wirelessly twice a day at noon and midnight. Uh, data that comes in will show usage uh, by the hour for the past 12 hours. And uh, per the contract, each day the city should get at least 98.5% of these meters read wirelessly. There's usually something that's going to prevent a meter from getting read in a day. A uh, vehicle parked over it, uh, bad weather conditions. Um, and this morning uh, when I looked at it, was uh, we had a 97.1% read. Um, and the Project is ongoing to help boost that number, um, usually by changing out meter meter boxes and uh, metal lids that will interfere with the signal. So during the installation process, uh, staff did receive some complaints uh, about leaks resulting from the meter swap and or damage to the property lines for not being properly flushed. Uh, the city's been investigating these claims of leaks and coordinating repairs when applicable, um, and staff is working to facilitate resolution of a few of these that are still outstanding, but uh, the vast majority have been uh, taken care of to date. 
um, for the high water bills th throughout the year and, and prior to the change out, staff does receive regular complaints of high water bills. Um, usually in the summer months, those increase as people start watering more. Uh, just this past August, we started seeing an increase complaints above what our normal average would be. Um, uh, in the hotter, or yeah, so usually occurs in the hotter months whenever uh, people start using their sprinklers more and more. Um, bills start going up, we get more complaints. Uh, but this year we started getting um, even more than normal. Uh, so staff became aware of a significant amount of discussion and complaints on social media about high water bills. And those claims generally involved bills being too high, uh, meters being faulty, so residents believing they could not have used that much water or finding articles in other cities where uh, meters weren't properly calibrated. Um, or that the meter swap caused a leak and now they're being uh, forced to pay for it. Uh, frontline staff has worked with customers to determine if it's an issue and if it can't be resolved, uh, would forward the complaint to the city management. So they take the, the first initial call. Um, staff has ordered uh, postcards going over common causes of high water bills and asking citizens um, with questions to contact util utility billing or uh, the city management. Uh, these actually were delivered today, and uh, they are now in the um, 311 area, the utility billing area. Uh, they are in the animal shelter, library, and the senior center. Um, as of today, we're, we have the highest foot traffic in the city. I'm going to go ahead and hand out a couple of these, and then they'll... Hmm? Oh, they got them already? Perfect. Well, I have more if anyone would like some. <laughs> All right, I'll tell you what, Mr. Walters, while you're passing those out... Uh, I got one of the new meters at my house several months ago. Uh, immediately thereafter, I, I began getting a notice from the city that um, it appeared that I had a leak. Uh, turns out, in the end, that I had multiple leaks. I don't know if they existed before I got the new meter or not, but when I got the new meter, the city was able to show me that I had constant water usage over time even when there was no one at my house. Now, I, I did check with my 18-year-old to make sure he didn't stay home from school during some of that time, and he was actually at school, so I know that there was no one at the house. Uh, I ended up having to effect some repairs. I, I was surprised to learn that I had uh, multiple leaks. I had one in the yard. I had one uh, at, the, uh, at the cut that went to my water softener, and I had two inside my house. Uh, that were slow leaks. So I, on one hand, would say it was somewhat expensive and painful to, to find out that I had leaks and, and, and get those remediated. On the other hand, knowing that I had them uh, was also helpful. So I, I, I tell that story not only because Mr. Walters is away from the microphone and passing out cards to everyone that wanted them, uh, but, but I was affected as well. Uh, it turns out the problems were on my side, not on the city side, and had nothing to do with the actual installation of the water meter uh, after I had two separate plumbers come out and investigate for me. So my last comment is this. We, we recognize that <coughs> it's been an extraordinarily dry summer, one of the warmest on record. We also recognize that not everything that is manufactured is without defect at some level in a manufacturing run. There are bound to be a few water meters that are out there that are not functioning properly. And we have put into place, as you see on these cards, um, a way for A, any water customer to contact the water department and ask questions and have those questions answered. And B, if you have challenges with, that are ongoing and you can't get to resolution, uh, how you can get in touch with our, our management staff. Uh, we're committed to, to listening to everyone's challenges uh, and getting those, those things resolved. Um, if anybody is watching this video, my phone number is 210-452-8003. I've had a number of folks contact me, and we've worked through the issues. And I would invite you to, 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 to bring any challenges with regard to water to the city. With that, Mr. Walters, I give it back to you. Yes, and you took the words right out of my mouth. Uh, <laughs> these uh, postcards are... Uh, do give some advice if you have um, a water leak or a high water bill to kind of go through first. But ultimately, the point of those uh, cards is to give citizens our contact information, encourage them to contact us, 
because uh, we do want to look into it. We do want to see if there's anything that can be done or if we can identify the problem and get it corrected as soon as we can. Absolutely. When we're all, listen, all of us that are up here on the dais, we, we're all water customers as well. and We're all neighbors together. And our water source and the way that we bill for, the way that we manage, the way that we protect that water source affects all of us. So we're, we're in this together. Anybody has any challenges, please bring them to the water department or please bring them to the, uh, to the staff or to any member of council. And we're committed to working with you to figure out what's going on. Uh, it, it may be that we find that everything's just working correctly now and that the previous meter may not have been working correctly. But if there are problems, we'll figure them out together and we'll address them. Mr. Edwards. You know, Mr. Walters, could you please give this gentleman, Frank, could you take some of those to the senior center? Can you get a stack of those for him? We already have a stack over at the senior center. Okay. All right. Thank you. Oh, Very good. Thank, okay. thank you. Mrs. Hayward? Oh, no, I have plenty more. But. Oh, well, then go Hold on. That's, a, that's okay. Let's, let's just continue. All right. Mr. Walters? All right. Um, so a big concern expressed um, uh, from citizens was that the meters were not reading flows accurately. Uh, each meter comes with uh, documented tests from the factory. Uh, but the city went out and wanted an independent test to make sure and verify that, you know, sellers selling something, they could say it works, and then um, we get it could be something completely different. Uh, so we have a third-party test. So we had fluid, me uh, fluid meter service out of Austin. Uh, we have 15 meters actually tested to date. We have another five planned um, at least. Uh, tests were done at three different flow levels, low, medium, high. Uh, all tests. Uh, Results so far have shown the meters are measuring within the parameters set by the American Water Works Association, so within 1.5 percent accuracy. Um, uh, these were these were meters from folks who had complained to us about their water bills. Is that right? Or uh, we did a sampling, so some of them were uh, customers that did have uh, a complaint or issue with their water bill. Uh, some were um, uh, shirts uh, employees, and then some were random uh, picks from throughout the city in different neighborhoods. Uh, so this is a sample of the report we get back. So at uh, different flow rates, the meter could have a different um, uh, accuracy depending on uh, which flow rate it's at. Uh, so you can see if this one down here is at 99.6, 100.8, 100 100.6. So as long as it's over 98.5 or below 101.5, it's considered accurate and recommended for use in the, in the residential district. Uh, but these results do not mean there are not uh, other issues. Uh, so the staff is continuing to research complaints. Um, we have also produced a flyer and then the postcard uh, we mentioned uh, directing them to uh, call us if they have questions or concerns. And these postcards and flyers are located at Utility Building uh, 311, the front office and the city manager's uh, building, uh, the animal shelter, library, and the senior center. We want to put those out, so those are the locations with the most foot traffic uh, with the city. So. Uh, one of the other issues we have found um, was uh, weak signal strength on some meters. So meters, uh, their meter reads aren't coming through daily as they should. Um, this could result in short billing months and then longer billing months. Um, so it looks like you get a small bill, then all of a sudden you get a huge bill, uh, and that huge bill is really just a month and a half or something like that. Um, all water is being uh, used, just not billed in the correct month. So the meter is still reading accurately. The signal is not strong enough to get to the tower to send it to us. Um, and on daily fashion. Um, and since we have a tiered rate structure, this could leave some to have a higher bill um, due to this, uh, this error. So if you had a, like a 30,000 gallons um, normal, and then all of a sudden you get a 60,000, that 60,000 is billed at a higher rate uh, when it should be at maybe 230s or 245s in some months instead. Um, so when made aware, staff is averaging out the usage during affected months, spreading that out. Um, we're also uh, can pull up to 60 days. So if it's longer than 60 days, we won't have the data. But if it's within 60 days, we can go pull the hourly reads from the meter itself and then back populate um, 
the information in, in my water advisor and in our, our back end system and then recalculate the bills. Uh, going forward, staff is reviewing the accounts that are picking up and we're sending out a tech to do some problem solving. Um, this is what I mentioned a little bit before with the metal lids can also often cause problems like this um, or meter boxes get in the way and they're probably just some dead zones in the city that we're currently working through and trying to find a more permanent solution. Uh, staff has started, started rolling out the mywateradvisor.com where residents can view their hourly data. Um, weak signal strength, uh, what that happens if you're looking at that data, it could look like you have a day or a couple of hours uh, with absolutely no usage whatsoever. Could be weeks in some of the worst case scenarios. And then all of a sudden when it finally gets that signal back, it's gonna put all of that usage on that hour that the signal came back. So it's gonna look like zero, 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 a thousand. Um, when it really should be something more in the hundreds uh, throughout that entire time frame. So if you see that, we can fix that in the system. Uh, it's a manual entry or a manual um, process that we have to initiate on our side. Um, one of the other issues we found is some of the old meters had begun to fail before they were swapped out. Uh, in those cases, consumption was estimated. Uh, we didn't have a, a, a working meter um, a register. So we were very conservative with the estimate um, going off the nationwide averages of um, how many people live in a home um, and then using that for their monthly consumption, even if they were using more. If they were using less and we saw the history, uh, it was proven that they were using less than the national average, we went off their history instead. Um, and in some cases, the estimation would be done last summer as well. It could cause some, it looks like they were probably watering, but we're using a very conservative for last summer. And then this summer, uh, when we get the actual reads, it looks like a big jump. This could actually just billing for what they're actually using now. Um, as I mentioned before, the yeah, estimating is leads to artificially low bills and bills for estimate conservatively with the new meters. Uh, they're getting billed for actual usage. Um, we've had a couple of these um, issues. Uh, we've also found uh, power outages could res uh, reset timers on irrigation systems back to factory settings. So we know that uh, GVC is swapping out meters as well and cutting off some power to homes when that happens or maybe during a storm. Um, so GVC has now been um, telling customers, hey, your meter's been swapped out, check such, 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 such. They're adding their irrigation timers as that too, as well. Um, so you may think you're turning back on and using last year's settings at only half an hour, but it could be back to uh, factory settings or new home settings, which is watering um, a lot in order to get that grass uh, Um, and I mentioned before, staff is still looking, uh, continue to look for problems and issues with the system and everyone's different, everyone has some uh, unique issues and going through those, taking those one at a time and trying to figure out, um, working with the customer and figuring out what the actual issue is. Um, but as staff is looking through these issues and hearing about issues in the region, uh, some factors are coming to light that could play another role in all this. Um, as we mentioned, um, the mayor mentioned you know, temperature and rainfall, so this is the average July, August, September for 2018 and 19 compared side by side. So the average temperature is about three degrees higher during this three month period and the rain is uh, much, much lower than we saw last year. Um, uh, in a, or as the average temperatures um, throughout the four year, for a four year history, uh, we haven't seen too much variation. Um, we are at the highest um, temperature we've had in August, September uh, that we've had in the past three or four years and that will come below with the total rainfall. This is our rainfall current for this year. You notice in April, May, June, we had a lot of rainfall. We had very low water bills during that time, low water consumption. And then starting in July, it's been almost non-existent. We've had the lowest rainfall of actually in the past three years. Um, we actually pulled the data, uh, data from uh, Search Seguin local, or not, yeah, Search uh, Shirt Seguin local government corporation who we buy our water from. Uh, so September and August were actually the highest months on average of our water take from SSLGC. And they have a completely separate metering system that didn't get swapped out. Um, this is showing that the, we had the most water usage than we've ever had in our, in our history. Um, you see over here, we had a lot of water or a lot of rain. We were at very low usage. And as soon as it started drying out and the temperature started rising, uh, we started using a lot more water. Um, as far as other communities, uh, SAWS uh, is having some similar uh, complaints. Um, as well as similar data. They've actually pumped 297.9 million gallons per day in August. That's the highest August they have on average since uh, 2010. 
uh, also unusual, San Antonio and the Edwards Aquifer was in July and August. Uh, they were technically drought months, but the aquifer never fell below that level to instigate um, restrictions. Um, so they have also been flooded with calls for unusual high water bills as well. Um, as uh, we mentioned, we've had a, a lot of uh, leaks found after new meters were installed. Um, that was because once they're installed, uh, we actually get leak alerts on our side, and uh, we were calling customers right as soon as we got those in. Um, uh, we're trying to be proactive on that. We have had some pushback from some people saying, um, I've never had a bill, or I never had a leak. My water bill is the same as always. Our response is yes. We think you've always had this leak. It's just not been big enough um, to actually affect your bill, or, or probably affect your bill by like $10 a month. Uh, but now we can see that and try to get out ahead of it. We've had some pushback um, saying that we actually caused the leak when we installed the meter. Um, and there were a couple of cases that we actually had um, some breaks in the line that attached to the new meter. Uh, so it's in that zone, that area, right when it connects to the meter, that was usually caused by improper installation. Um, or maybe the ground had moved during the time and they were trying to, to bend the old pipe to fit in the meter and that caused a breakage. Um, so in those cases, um, uh, city staff coordinated the repair of those, uh, those leaks. I um, also wanted to I touched on this other uh, briefly. The city has a tiered system for water use. So the more water you use, the higher rate that's paid. Uh, San Antonio has a similar structure or a similar um, thought process. And uh, there was a news story recently about um, their tiered rate structure. Um, so this could result in a higher bill than expected. So it's not just I use twice as much water, my bill should be twice as high. That's not always the case. If you use twice as much water, your bill could be even more expensive. Um, so I did a little comparison of the rate structures side by side. Um, for sure, it's the base rate, which is what we charge on um, every uh, account that's active, uh, 2461. Uh, San Antonio's base rate's 1282. Then we have a rate per thousand. Um, so San Antonio actually starts at 74 cents and then goes up to 481. Whereas here in shirts, we start at 304, and we get to the 481 about the same time San Antonio does, um, but then after that, ours keeps increasing. And this has been our structure for um, many, many years. Now, this is an excerpt I wanted to go back, because I showed you that, I wanted to go back to what we looked at when we did the uh, um, Will Dan rate study uh, this past year. Uh, so the average water and wastewater um, bill on shirts is uh, about 202 gallons if we use 10,000 gallons of water and 8,000 gallons of wastewater. Those same comparisons to other cities in the area, we saw San Antonio has a very low rate structure because they have access to the Edwards walk, uh, Aquifer, um, as well as New Braunfels, Sel or, uh, Georgetown, Kirby, those all have lower um, rate structures. If you look at Seguin, Cibolo, San Angelo, San Marcos, Bernie, uh, they all have a higher rate structure than us. And you expect Seguin to be right around us because we're getting water from the same source. So SSLGC water is more expensive than the Edwards Aquifer. On the flip side, we don't have any water restrictions that they have. Uh, so staff recommendation, again, is check irrigation systems for leaks and timer settings um, published by SAWS in one of the news articles. An irrigation system can be uh, use an average of 3,000 gallons per cycle. Um, Please sign up for the mywateradvisor.com to view your monthly, daily, and hour usage data for your home or business. You can also set up high uh, usage alerts, so if you reach a, past a certain point, the system will automatically tell you, hey, you've, you're getting close to a, a, a peak or a high or something more you, than you don't want to spend. Um, in light of recent concerns, uh, staff will continue not to assess uh, late penalties or turn off accounts that are delinquent. Uh, we're thinking November, we thought we'd start in October, but due to the influx of these high bills, we're gonna push that back a little bit more, play that by ear, but when we start those up again. Uh, again, I mentioned this, please contact Utility Billing if you have any questions or concern over a high water bill. Um, so what staff, sta staff has found so far, we have tested the meters that are reading correctly. Um, staff will can focus on solving uh, or looking into unresolved cases. Um, if there's other issues or other people wanna get their meter tested, there are ways we can do that in-house. Uh, we can continue to send the meters off to be tested by an independent third party um, just to make sure that we didn't miss one. We're trying to get a good sampling, at least by area, um, but we 
have that ability now, we have that contact that we can send meters off. Uh, it takes about $20 per meter, and it takes about a meter tech an entire day's worth of uh, work to drive up to Austin and drop it off and then bring it back. Um, I mentioned August Water was, uh, SSLGC was the largest in city's history, and SAWS also has some record uh, water consumption for August. You know, we have postcards directing fresh rate residents to call city management, utility billing. Uh, as I mentioned, we'll still continue to test water meters for accuracy. We'll continue to work with customers who have concerns about their bills, and particular ones who have uh, not been able to determine why the use is high as it is. We have had some of those come through. Uh, we try to work with customers. We see high water uh, consumption, and maybe sporadic, uh, maybe just during a month, and then it seems to have evened out. We're not sure why it is. Uh, we can just tell, um, should be able to tell when the water is being used, and it's up to an interaction between staff and the resident to kind of figure out what's going on in that particular situation. Um, as I mentioned before, if you have cases where we have not been able to determine you know, what the actual issue is, we have a limited number of spikes in the usage, um, or customers don't feel their irrigation system are using as much water as the system indicates. Um, to wrap up, I want to walk you through sort of an example of what staff procedures are. Um, so say a customer calls in with questions on a high water bill, and this is an example that was just about a week old. Um, first, staff will check their build consumption history in our billing software. You can see that on the right. Uh, it does look like this gentleman had that 66,500 gallons that was um, billed that he received. Normally he gets about a 7,000 or maybe a 1,000 um, gallon bill. So we verify the consumption is indeed high. Uh, we logged into Harmony, that's our side of the portal where we get the hourly data. Um, we also look at it daily, so in this situation we saw about normal, this is 47 gallons, 37 gallons. And right around August 29th, we saw a steadily increasing amount. And then it started leave, leveling off about 2,000 gallons a day. Um, so we noticed that's uh, uh, rising daily usage, and it's consistent, and it's been on the entire time. It's not high one day and then low another day. Um, I did want to point out on this one, this is also a good example. Um, this was a 12 hour period where the water um, did not read from uh, the meter. So this is actually, this 2,800 is actually 900 of that actually belongs here, and it would even out to about 2,000 gallons. Um, if it's just one misread, shouldn't affect billing, um, and it's usually able to be overlooked, it's when this is multiple days um, or weeks when it doesn't pick up, it becomes a problem where staff has to take uh, direct action. Uh, but basically we looked at this account, we noticed that the reads are high every single day, um, and not sporadic, which would indicate maybe a uh, irrigation system. So then we can drill down and look at the per hour. Um, so one thing we notice is every hour it's just under 100 gallons, sometimes a little more, sometimes a little less, depending on the water pressure. So finding that the use is consistent, this actually indicates to us that there may be a leak on the property. Um, if it's not a leak, if it's an irrigation system, we should see periods where it drops down to zero, um, near zero, but having it all day every day at that level indicates to us that there's uh, water leaking on the property somewhere. Uh, so as mentioned by uh, uh, Frank, this information can be printed out and given to customers or can be viewed by the customers at the mywateradvisor.com. So customers can sign up and see this exact information over there. Um, due to the water's continuous flow, staff works with the customer to see if there's a faucet left on, if there's some uh, an open tap somewhere. Um, Especially at this level, it's 100 gallons per hour. That's going to be a pretty big uh, one. It's not necessarily a, a, a leaky pipe somewhere or inside the house. Um, and so we try to work with the customer and go through some questions, see if we can help identify working together where those leaks are occurring. Um, in this case, a plumber was required to come out um, to locate and stop the leak, and they, they were able to do that. Um, one thing that we have found because of the soil we live on, if there's a leak and it's pointing the wrong direction, it's going straight down into the ground and not bubbling up. Uh, we had the similar instance in our Pickerel Park. Uh, we had a bunch of leaks there. There was no wet spots, but we were spending fifty, sixty thousand dollars 60000 in our own water bills um, in that park until we could try to get that under control. Um, so we do it. That is a, an issue we have here just by living in the soil we have. Um, looking back, you know, staff can look back at this account and see that the leak was stopped on uh, October 17th, 2019. Um, I didn't drill down into the individual hour, but we could see the individual hour that it was stopped on. 
Uh, then staff reaches out and communicates to this customer to fill out a leak adjustment form to lower the bill. Um, everything on the customer side is uh, responsible to the customer. Um, but what we can do is then uh, lower that bill down to charge them the um, basically a wholesale. Basically, what, what is that a cost? The lowest tier of all that water. And give them a little bit of break on the, the water bill. Uh, so that's what I have for you tonight. Um, is there any particular discussion point or topic um, the council had left unanswered or if you have any questions over our processes, procedures, or what staff is doing uh, going forward? Mr. Larson, I think you had asked that this be placed on the agenda. Do you have anything in, in, in addition? No, I think he uh, covered the bases. I mean, I guess maybe I can rephrase to make sure I understand it, but ultimately um, the data we're seeing is that there's not a structural problem and any individuals having um, issues that seem out of the ordinary should contact city staff and work with them directly to help resolve the issue. Is that a good summary in your view? Uh, the tests we've run so far do not indicate an issue uh, with the meter reads themselves. Uh, we do have issues on some accounts getting the reads to the city, and we're working on that. And we're not saying that we won't find meters that aren't reading properly. Um, there have been some that we've had to swap out um, isolated um, those as they are. Okay, great. Thank you very much for the presentation. Mr. Gutierrez. Yeah, thanks. Thanks for the presentation. Um, I actually had an opportunity to talk to uh, HydroPro during the TML conference. You know, 14,000 meters, that's quite a bit of uh, meters that were installed. Uh, one thing that they indicated is that, um, you know, our residents can do some self-testing like you indicated, turn off all the water, go out there and see whether or not that meter is reading. If it is, you have a leak. And that's the best way to approach it. And then to check to whether or not your, your meter's cal calibrated correctly, get a five gallon bucket, fill it up with water, and see if it registers five. If it does, you're okay. If it registers 10 or 15, you need to bring it up to our attention. So there's self-testing that our residents can do. Uh, you know, and like you indicated, the water is going to follow the path of least resistance. Your neighbor might be getting their water long by your, by your water. Uh, you know, there's, there's things that you need to look at. If you have a leak, it might go down. You may not notice that uh, the water is surfacing, it, but it's going probably down or in your neighbor's uh, yard. But I think the biggest thing is that do some self-testing and make sure it's calibrated correctly or you don't have a leak. Uh, I was fortunate enough, uh, I ran into the crew that were fixing a leak over in uh, Woodland Oaks and it was on our side. It wasn't uh, reading on the meter side. And there was another individual uh, on Eli Whitney. Uh, he had called me and he had a leak. It was right next to his foundation but he wouldn't have noticed. He never did until he, we got the city, we, turned, we saw the meter reading, and they discovered the leak. Uh, but that's what I had told this individual. Check it before you call the city. Well, he did. And then I got involved and we shut the water off, but it was a plumber that needed to fix this leak. I, I urge everyone, uh, if you have a high meter reading, check it and then call us. Uh, you know, our staff will work with you to try to make sure uh, everything is correct. We certainly don't want to bill you more than what your fair share is or what you, or, or what you consumed. Thanks. Thanks for the briefing. And if you do have a leak, please call the city. We do have a leak adjustment uh, form. Um, sometimes it uh, could be a, a decent amount. Other times it'll only be a few bucks, but every little bit will help in what we can provide. Indeed. Mrs. Hayward? So um, I did the same thing. I talked to several different manufacturers at the TML conference, and I actually did the self-test. Um, my husband went out, and he looked at the meter, registered the number. I filled a five-gallon bucket, and it registered 5.09. So it was pretty spot on. Um, one of the manufacturers, which wasn't ours, gave me a little tool. And with that tool, even with like a toilet leak, a 1 16th of a leak, it's this little, little teeny hole, like a pinhole, you end up wasting 24,000 gallons a month. 
So it doesn't matter. And if you have like a leaky toilet or like we had one that was like a, a flush on its own in the middle of the night, fill back up, flush on its own, it was causing us to have a higher water usage with the new bill. We didn't have that and didn't know that with the old meter and then talking with one of the manufacturers, the old meters had plastic teeth. They could break off and they weren't always registering when you use water. So you could be using water. These new meters register water with, with one eighth of a gallon. So they're pretty spot on. And so again, doing the self test I think works and we tried it and we got a good result. So I think that's just a tip for everyone and also call the water company, if you see something, if you go out and your meter's running and you have, don't have any water on and you turn the toilets off and you have it, it's probably a leak. And it's just simple self-testing. And then I think that that helps out a little bit. All right, Dr. Scagliola. Yeah, I was just wondering about the water averaging. Uh, somebody has an unusually high bill. Um, the water averaging, what, what's it, September, October, or November, or is it October, November, and December? It'll kick off in October. Um, in October? October? November, December, January. Well, the city will take the lowest three months okay. in that section. Um, and if you do have a leak uh, during that, let us know, and we can take that into consideration and manually adjust um, your sewer average when that comes Excellent. in. Excellent. Thank you. All right. Anyone else? Mr. Davis. Have this presentation put in the Dropbox for us. Thank you. All right, anyone else? All right, if not, thank you, sir. I appreciate it. And I, I what I think someone on council will probably ask you to come and visit again in about sixty to ninety days and let us know where we are. We'll be happy to. Very good. Thank you, sir. I appreciate it. All right, next item that we have on the agenda this evening is the City Council Code of Ethics, and I asked for this to be put on the agenda. I brought this up before, but I'd like to bring it up one more time before Council. Uh, what I would ask is this. I, I talked to Mr. Santee briefly, and um, I, I believe that uh, uh, our City Attorneys can bring forward a suggestion or a best practice for us to consider with regard to vetting um, ethics complaints. The way that we have our code of ethics set up today, there is no way for us to vet the veracity of an ethics complaint without putting it on the agenda. There's some pluses and minuses to that. What I would say, however, is this. Without a method, and, and a number of other cities have ways that they do this, without a method to, to investigate and to vet an ethics complaint. Not that I would ever, ever anticipate it being done, but someone could bring in 10 complaints that have no basis in fact, and it would, all of them would have to be put on the agenda. And for all of those, we would have to name the place that that complaint was made against and or the mayor, um, regardless of whether or not they have any basis in fact. So I, I, would, I would ask if you would, if there's no dissent from council, allow Mr. Santee to go do a little bit of work and come back to us with either some best practices from other cities or even potentially a, uh, uh, some revisions to the code of ethics that would allow for us to have a better management system uh, should any complaints come forward. It's up to the council. I, I, this is a suggestion that I have having having been accused in the past of an ethics violation that had no basis in fact uh, and, and having to, to go through that that was done during an election cycle, uh, it would have been very valuable to have my peers uh, or, or a body review those complaints to find out if they had, again, any basis in fact. Uh, and I think that's only fair to the membership uh, as well as to the city at large. Because I will tell you that if someone decided that they wanted to bring spurious ethics complaints every week to the development community outside looking in, they don't know that we don't ha currently have a way to vet those. And they're just looking at going, what's going on in that city that they have these on their agenda every week? And I think that's a risk position that can be mitigated um, with, with some, some good practices. So is there anyone that, that would 
disagree with having the city city attorneys do that work for us? No, sir. And I also think maybe we should have a subcommittee of council members to actually be a part of it. And uh, and that may be one of the recommendations that comes back. I, I, there's actually a body that is not city council, I believe, in San Antonio, a citizen committee that reviews those complaints and independently decides whether or not they have merit and should be brought forward. But uh, if 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 again, if there's no dissension from council, then Mr. Santee, would you and the firm shortly bring back some suggestions, best practices, uh, and if if it's clear what what you recommend potentially even a draft uh, uh, of the changes. Okay, very good. I, I really do appreciate the council taking that, um, that consideration. Next thing I have on the agenda this evening, uh, there's no need for a roll, ball, roll call vote confirmation. We took no action on either of the workshop items, so the next will be announcements by the city manager. Dr. Brown? Uh, the only thing I wanted to do was to uh, thank James. He stepped out for his presentation and, uh, and the water department's hard work on uh, the water leaks and the water meters. Um, that They really do work hard trying to do the best for the residents. Also, uh, Brian James has spent many, many hours uh, working with individual residents, going out to residences, um, personally looking at the situation on the ground, and I think it's been very helpful in, in helping us resolve those issues. So I just appreciate the staff effort on this. Thank you, sir. Next up, request by the mayor and council members that items be placed on a future council agenda. Anything that we need that hasn't already been scheduled? Doesn't look like I have any takers. I'll move on to announcements by the mayor and council members. Dr. Scagliola? Yeah, we had a request for uh, looking into the uh, senior center. Uh, I, I've heard a, a, a good deal of information. There's some really good programs that, that are over there. Um, I'd like to get an update. It doesn't have to be immediate. But um, one, one of the things in consideration is uh, where do we go from here, say five, ten years? What's our development plan? And and the the other thing was the uh, a fair chance ordinance. I really I really didn't understand uh, all the aspects of that, and um, it doesn't have to be an agenda item. But I'd I'd like some uh, information from staff related to that. So if I have it correct, there's a request for a, um, a, a briefing on the current status and usage, et cetera, with regard to the senior center, and then you just need staff to give you some information on the other item, not necessarily an agenda item. Yes, sir. Okay, very good. Anyone else? All right, if not, then we're going to go to announcements by the mayor and council members, and we'll start with uh, Mayor Pro Tem Brown. I uh, attended TML there last week. As uh, some of you heard, it's quite, an, quite a uh, conference and a lot of attendees, lots of uh, vendors out there, and great information uh, to be shared. Other than that, nothing. Very good. Mr. Davis? I had the pleasure of attending the uh, first meeting for the Guadalupe County uh, Community Coalition looking at uh, the effects of drug, alcohol, and smoking on our youth. Uh, there'll be more to come on that in the near future. And I also attended the uh, Shirts Housing Authority meeting this past month. Thank you, Mr. Gutierrez. Quite a bit. It's been uh, quite some time since we had our meeting. Uh, first, uh, thank you, Brenda, for the National Night Out, putting that together. Appreciate your work there. Also attended uh, Love, Where, Love Where You Live. Uh, that was uh, Councilman Fowler's, uh, 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 I mean, his um, one of his legacies that he left here as uh, from being council. Uh, there was approximately close to 120 people that helped us on that, uh, on that area there. Uh, a lot of work that was done by, by several people. Appreciate all, everybody that participated. Uh, the TML, we also attended TML. That's a great opportunity to meet, our, meet the uh, businesses that do business with uh, the city. Uh, that's where I got the information about Hydro Pro and, and some other, uh, some other uh, individuals there. Uh, the car show, October 12th, uh, that was uh, pretty nifty, seeing the old cars. Uh, sometimes uh, it reminds you of the old times when you were young. Uh, the uh, Philippine Festival, uh, that was also, I line dance there, I, I, I practice my skills there. Uh, Columbus Day, I'd like to thank the uh, Knights of Columbus for uh, uh, having the uh, meals for seniors that day. Uh, and that's all I have. Very good. Mr. Larson? Mr. Edwards? Nothing, sir. Dr. Scagliola? Yeah, TML was, was a, a busy week, very, very rewarding. Uh, last weekend, also went off to the um, uh, Castle. There was a, a Casa Casino Night. Uh, went as a volunteer. Really good organization. 
And then, uh, as Dennis, thank you so very much for uh, hosting that that uh, uh, student council program. Absolutely wonderful this to um, interact with with uh, the leaders of tomorrow. That's all I have, sir. Very good, Mrs. Hayward. Um, I attended the manufacturing day at ITM. Uh, I also did Love Where You Live, Coffee with Cops. Um, and then I did a manufacturing day with Caterpillar. It was interesting because they brought in about 20 girls to see the plant to show them um, what jobs are out there other than just jobs that seems to be for young men. Uh, attended the um, TML work uh, conference. That was amazing. It was a lot to take in. I look forward to next year. Um, I did the um, fire prevention uh, contest. That was amazing to see some of the talent that the young kids had. I did the chamber luncheon, and then today the student council. Thanks, Brenda, for putting that together. It's getting young kids to understand how city government works, and I think more people need to learn how city government works so they'll understand it's not an easy task being up here. That is all. All right. If there's nothing else then from staff or from council, then we stand adjourned.